Cape of Good Hope is no place for swimmers. For the currents that surround it are unpredictable and cruel, and the water is mind-numbingly cold. But there is one man who thinks this is the perfect place to train. You've got the two oceans meeting here, the Atlantic over there, Indian over there, you've got the southern down there, you've got three oceans meeting here, and it is a, it's a storm here. And when you get in the water, it is extremely unfriendly. Endurance athlete Lewis Pugh is building up his body and testing his nerve with nothing but a costume, cap and goggles to protect him. Is the shark shield on? Just double check it, please. Pugh wants to do something that's never been done before. He's going to risk his life off England's southern shore with the most dangerous swim of his career. We are you know, completely redefining the Everest of swimming. best place which I can train because it's so damn rough. The water is swirling underneath you. It's it's scary. And courage is a little bit like a muscle. You need to be swimming in these conditions. This is the best training. Lewis has come to the wild waters of southern Africa to prepare for a very special swim. From Land's End to Dover for five hours a day in 50 days. I think the cumulative effect of day after day after day in the cold water of the English Channel will make this, without a shadow of a doubt, the toughest swim I've ever done. And I just don't know how I'll do it. What can you see underneath the water? Plenty of animals, seals playing underneath me, lots of jellyfish. I haven't seen any sharks yet. If I see a shark, I'll be in that boat quicker than you can, quicker than you can imagine. Lewis Pugh is a swimming pioneer. I've swum in the Arctic, I've swum in the icy waters of Antarctica, I've swum in every ocean of the world, the Pacific, the Indian, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, the Southern Ocean. I've swum in some of the most dangerous waters on, the, on this earth and the coldest waters. I rank this 10 out of 10 for, for difficulty. I think this is the most difficult swim I've ever undertaken by a long way. And he's become a master campaigner, fighting for the future of the seas. I have seen our oceans change. And we need a wake-up call. We need to really take our oceans seriously, and we need to be protecting them. And the, what I've been seeing is the impacts of climate change, overfishing, and pollution. I've seen how these swims can actually change things. With the long swim, he's campaigning to fully protect 30% of our oceans by 2030. I've been swimming in, you know, in the remote parts of the world and trying to take the message then from the remote parts of the world into the great big capitals. Now I'm going to be swimming you know, along the south coast and taking that message, taking it home. So about 1,800 people have swum across the English Channel. So from Dover to Calais or from Calais to Dover, what I'm planning to do is to swim the full length of the English Channel. So starting in Land's End and swimming all the way along the coasts of south of England, all the way to the end to Dover. It's 560 kilometers, and I think it's going to take me around about 50 days to complete. It's a, it's a mammoth swim. It's equivalent to 16 English channels back to back. Lewis seeks advice from an old friend whose ship, the Polar Explorer HMS Protector, is moored off Cape Town. Matt Sirrett is the youngest captain in the Royal Navy. 
He is also the former hydrographer or chief map maker, and he can help to navigate the hazards. I mean, we, we grew up together in Plymouth as, as young boys. He knows that coastline like the back of the hand. What I'm looking for is the places along the coast where we need to be really, really careful, cautious. Just, I mean, you've been sailing along this coast your whole life. Yeah, absolutely. I grew up in Plymouth um, and have been in the Navy for 28 years. The idea of swimming 560 kilometres, which is 16 English channels, for me, I can't even, I can't even think that far because it, it's so much. And yes, it's easy to sort of break it down and say, I'm just going to swim day by day by day. But the furthest I have ever swum would only get me somewhere to, to close to Weymouth. That's 21 days of swimming. This is paradox. I know I will get to the White Cliffs of Dover. I just don't know how. Well, you're going to swim there, hopefully. <laughs> Together, they note the dangers on England's treacherous southern coast. So if you, if you look in here off St Albans Ledge, you can see the rough weather water uh, indicated, the overfalls are indicated in there. But these symbols are whirlpools. They're back eddies. These are the most dangerous, in my view, at, at this time of year. Captain Syrett was mindful of the psychological challenge as well as the physical test. You're inside the Solent and there's a sense of euphoria as you go through here. A lot of people, middle of summer, lots of schools on holiday. I'm sure you'll see your maximum levels of support because people can get close to you. But once you pass Selsey Bill, the coastline changes and you've still got an awful long way to Dover and your finish line. Not only am I tired, but the team will also be tired every single day coming out to sea. Yeah, and don't underestimate it. I mean, it, it could be that the Solent is your easiest phase, and then you get past Selsey Bill, and you'll get that feeling of loneliness again, where you and your team are on your own, just grinding us out to the end to meet your goal. I'm swimming with a purpose. My purpose is that by the end, it's not so much that I've become the first person to swim the full length of the English Channel, but what I want is proper marine protected areas, not only around the United Kingdom, but around all the other nations of the world. What the scientists are telling us is that we need to have at least 30% of our oceans properly protected, fully protected by 2030 for our oceans to, to have any chance of survival. Our waters around the United Kingdom are 750,000 uh, square kilometers, 750,000 square kilometers. And in that, you will not believe how many are fully protected marine protected areas. Seven. Seven square kilometres out of 750,000 square kilometres are fully protected. No fishing, no oil and gas, no drilling, uh, no gunnery practice. Just leave it alone and allow nature to recover and to restore itself. Lewis Pugh did his first long distance swim on the frigid five mile stretch separating Cape Town from Robben Island, and he still comes here to train. I feel very, very nostalgic, because I, I remember as a young boy, I'd only learned how to swim two months beforehand, and coming out here to swim from Robben Island to, to Cape Town, and I, I was really nervous. And then also just nostalgic, because I just didn't realize that this would then become my passion, my love, and my work you know, campaigning for protecting these beautiful wilderness areas. The notorious apartheid-era prison built on the island has been preserved, and this remote spot is also home to a number of endangered species. Okay, come look over here. So this is no entry beyond this point, African penguin colony. This beach is used as a launching point for long-distance swims, and Pew has seen it change. Just two things which are just so striking. The first is just everywhere you go. Now, everywhere, plastic. 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 Everywhere, plastic. But the second thing is, this used to be a penguin colony. I can't see any penguins, and there's, you know, normally you'd have lots of them sort of hiding in the bushes here, but... There's nothing here. There's nothing. I think I heard one. 
we did find an academic researcher conducting a penguin census on the beach. Hi. How are you? I'm Lewis Pugh. And she too was struggling to find subjects for her study. Have you seen any change in the numbers of penguins on this beach? Yeah, I've been here, I've been doing this project for 10 years now, since 2008. Yeah. Um, and I've definitely noticed a change. There were many more birds in this, in this specific route that we do yeah. on the sandy beach um, and, and on the island as a whole. How do you, how do you feel when you, when you see the numbers just slowly dropping and dropping and dropping? Very, very sad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah do you think they've got a long-term prospect? Mm, it's very difficult to say. Mm. I really hope so, but it's not looking good at the moment. Yeah. I'm angry because I've, I feel like I've almost been, literally and metaphorically, a voice in the wilderness. I've been swimming out in the oceans for day after day after day, and I come ashore and I tell people about it, and I'm just not seeing a, a response from governments and business and civil society. The role of ocean advocate is a solitary profession, but his exploits in the water do generate attention. They've never ever done an easy Robben Island. I don't know, they always throw something at you. This water's cold, significantly colder than the English Channel. And uh, it's, it's a tough swim and it's absolutely great training to swim the length of the English Channel. So I'm doing this as many times as possible now, day after day after day, building up the mental fortitude and the, the physical courage to do this big swim. Pugh heads east through a great stand of kelp and out into the waters of Table Bay powered by his rhythmic and unfaltering stroke. These three-hour crossings are part of the routine. He does these swims every day. But the length of England's southern shore is 348 miles, and the conditions will not be this forgiving. You're on the brink of what emergency services can go out and... I've caught up a few swims. It's too dangerous. The cold water, you lose consciousness, you stop swimming. This is what our ocean should be like, you know teeming with wildlife as seals and dolphins and whales. Uh, but I don't see a lot of this around the world, and when I do, it's uh, absolute joy. <laughs> Lewis Pugh's vision of the future looks a lot like this. A rocky outcrop off the South African coast, crammed with Cape fur seals. They've been protected from hunting since 1990. And scientists say their numbers are on the rise. It's just absolute magic, isn't it? It's what I absolutely love, because the oceans are teeming with seals. This is what our seas can be like and should be like if we just protect them. Derek, I'm going to do a swim now, so I'm going to dive in here. And then I'm going to swim along the edge of the, uh, the reef over here and then out to sea. Uh, there's a load of seals here. So can you pop the shark attack uh, pod in the front of the boat? And if there's any drama, you see anything, straight into the boat. No ifs, no buts. to have courage to be able to do these type of swims, you've got to push yourself into that uncomfortable situation day after day after day. Um, and that's why I swim, you know, around the Cape of Good Hope or off Seal Island here, because it's extremely uncomfortable and it's, it's a frightening place to swim. I'm 
in their environment, I'm in their home, and they are wild animals. So there's always that little bit of angst. But on the other hand, the sheer joy of seeing these animals and the agility of them and the way they, they, they swing and, and, and surge underneath you and then come and look at you with their two big, beautiful, doughy eyes and the whiskers and the teeth. They are absolutely beautiful. They've got a good layer of insulation. They're perfectly adapted to this place. Humans are not meant to be swimming in these waters. Well, we're not designed to be swimming in these waters. If he's going to survive the frigid waters of the English Channel, he'll have to prepare for the cold like the seals do and fatten up. They want to have a, a decent layer of fat, so I'm going to go in there at about 100 kgs and then over the 560 kilometers, over the what we think will be 50 days, I'm going to get thinner and thinner and thinner. And it's almost it's a race against time. Are you hungry, Lewis? Mm. Am I hungry? Am I hungry? What's Lewis like if he doesn't get his breakfast? It's like, uh, I suppose, like a hungry polar bear. <laughs> I start getting hungry and I just need to eat more and more and more. Mm. Lewis Pugh has spent thousands of hours in the ocean training for his ultra swimming marathon. But he's also got to spend some time here at the kitchen counter. Two pieces of toast, some Marmite, four eggs, a big cup of coffee to wake me up, some yogurt and some berries, and, and just eat it up. And during the swim, I'll be burning so many calories, swimming five, six hours a day in big winds with the waves and also the cold. It's just not possible eat it all. How many calories do you take in a day? A, a normal adult male will be around about 2,500 per day. I reckon during the swim will be close on 10,000. Yeah, he's looking a bit lean. I would like to see some more fat on him. Professor Tim Noakes is an eminent sports scientist who has studied Lewis Pugh's physiology on a number of extreme cold water swims. The more fat you have, the, the, you, in a sense, it's like you're swimming in warmer water. So instead of being 14 degrees, if you're really fat, it's equivalent to swimming in 18 or 19 degrees water. And once you get a temperature up to 19 or 20, then you can, you can swim for many hours. So Lewis, would, I will be advising him to, to put on more weight, to get much fatter. When he gets cold, he starts to corkscrew through the water because he can't extend his arms. And so that's the sort of thing you look for. You look for how frequently he's, he's stroking, the distance he's traveling with each stroke. And once that starts to shorten, then you know that you're in trouble. And then he will become, he's not fully conscious. And that's what you have to read. And the problem then is the disappearing swimmer syndrome, that suddenly, if you don't watch your ass, you're a swimmer every second, and you go and make a cup of tea, you come back and there's no swimmer. They lose consciousness that quickly, and they just disappear. And that's happened in the English Channel. Cardiologist Otto Tanning is Lewis Pugh's longtime swimming partner and a member of his support team. The biggest and most important safety device, should he start getting cold, are the people on, on the boat. And they've been trained, and they know what to look out for. And he knows that the rule in open water swimming is that if the crew say you're getting out, you get out. If I am there and I feel he's got to get out, and I tell him to, I know he'll get out. If not, I'll take him out. Good Lord, it's blowing 52 knots now. It's, it's very appealing <laughs> to go back to bed now, but you, you need to train in the tough conditions. If you're not prepared to go out in the tough conditions when it really does get tough, and sometimes during swims, the conditions change, and it starts out a nice day and ends up really tough. If you're not prepared to go out on days like this, I mean, I will never get to Dover. It's that simple. I've just received a WhatsApp message from the city of Cape Town. So it's going around everybody, and it reads as follows. The city of Cape Town has released a warning ahead of hurricane-type storm. Wind speeds are between 100 and 140 kilometers per hour. Stay safe and remain indoors. 
Let's go swimming. No, I've called off. I've called off a few swims. It's too dangerous. But I, I, I think today, today's borderline. We'll, we'll see. One of my safety kayakers is coming along now, and he's very, very experienced on these type of issues. And he's been out kayaking this morning, downwind with the wind. So I just want to get his view on it. Gonna be a good training session, Lewis. The wind is is swinging west, so you just need to understand. Um, you're on the brink of what emergency services can go out, and there's, def there's definitely no choppers or anything can go out. Yeah. The NSRI might, they at 30 knots, they, they're not so keen. So you're on that edge. Okay. Do you think it's doable, yes or no? It is doable yeah. for a small selection of people, yeah. okay. and I count you as one of those. After more than two hours in the water, he emerges, looking battered and blue. Yeah, that was extreme. It was really extreme. It was, uh, it was wild. But you know, uh, as I keep on saying, courage is, a, courage is a muscle, and unless you train it, you won't have it when you need it. And that was wild out there. And it's absolutely fantastic training for when I get into the channel. It'll be great. Courage was something you were... You, were, uh, you need you to train were, it. You need to train it every working, single day. You were working on it for yeah. the last couple of hours. Yep, and it just coming, even coming into this little bay here was a world of... a world of difficulty. Yep. But so we did it. And... Uh, and that's in the bag. Yes, he, he is unique. He's, he's got the right biology and he's trained himself, but he's much more important. He's got the desire to do something important and that's what will get him through the swim. It's, it doesn't become physiology. In the end, it's, it's what's in your head and what's driving you. There's only one way to swim from Land's End to Dover, and that's putting your head down and taking a stroke, and then taking another stroke and another stroke. And the way I do this is I just simply count. And so I put my head down, and then I take a stroke. One, and I breathe. Two, and breathe. Three, and breathe. And I'm just gonna keep on going for the next hour. I'm gonna keep on going for the next two hours and three hours, the next day, the next week, and the next month, until I finally will see the White Cliffs of Dover.